Hello everyone, I'm Transformers Fanco 328 here, and it's not about what you do differently, it's about what you do well. You're free to like what others hate and hate what others like, just so long as you're not doing it for the sake of being different. I liked Age of Extinction and hated Burial at Sea, so I'm no stranger to the idea. I'm going to show my love for another hated product right now, in Sonic and the Black Knight. From the beautiful graphics and rock and soundtrack to the surprisingly good story and fun gameplay, I've always wondered why people ragged on this one so much. Aside from the stigma of Sonic, which was to be expected at this point, and the ridiculous concept that Sonic wields a sword in King Arthur's time. Sure, the idea is a tad shark jumpy, but the Sonic series isn't exactly grounded in realism, and I think we should know by now not to judge books by their covers. It's all about the execution. Admittedly, more and more people are warming up to this game, but of course there are still people that don't like it for legitimate reasons, which is fine, I gotta practice what I preach, you know? But let's find out why I like this game so much. Let's start with that story. As presented in a beautifully rendered CG opening, a young girl is running away from... Onslaught possessed by Soul Edge, until she invokes a demonic incantation and summons... Sonic, of all people. Why under what- wait, does that mean Sonic is considered a devil by Arthurian lore? I am finding way too many little things that explain too much. We are told that the girl is named Merlina... Yeah, that name reeks of Lazy Laser to me, too. The not-so-black knight here is actually King Arthur corrupted by the power of Excalibur's scabbard. Eh, give him points for creativity. And his mere three knights of the round table are being portrayed by Sonic's more serious friends. Shadow is Lancelot, Blaze is Percival, and Knuckles is Gawain. So you have King Arthur and Merlin's granddaughter, who are as human as possible, and then you have anthropomorphic cats, echidnas, and hedgehogs serving as knights. And realistic ravens exist here, too. Consistency is all I ask for, people. And I'm not exactly consistent with my words, either. I hate it when a potential ally can be killed by you. There's two instances of that in this game. The first one is Gaius, the other is Tharja. If Krom can speak with him three times without killing him or dying himself, whatever. Merlina has Sonic obtain a sword and a stone called Caliburn so he can properly fight the Black Knight. And Caliburn talks. Because Middle Ages magic, I guess. At least Caliburn's personality allows for some humorous banter with Sonic, helping to form the sense of camaraderie between the two as both grow to tolerate and even like each other's company. Though I understand how the banter can be annoying to some. So Sonic fights King Arthur, and because Sonic's not at a high enough level, the bastard flees for the finale. After a few filler levels to introduce Tails the Blacksmith, or oh, hi foreshadowing, and set up a piss-easy fight with Sir Shadow, Sonic finds the Lady of the Lake, one of Amy Rose's better pre-Sonic Boom appearances, who tells him that he needs to pass three more filler side quests to prove himself a true knight worthy of defeating third-party Onslaught here. Of course, Sonic passes them, and Nimu, Nimu says that she can dispel the Scabbard's Phoenix Down properties with the previously mentioned Knights' of Sacred Swords. Having defeated Sir Shadow on the way to meeting Amy and prevented Sir Knuckles' suicide attempt during his tests, this leaves Sir Blaze to deal with. After defeating her and saving her from certain doom, earning Caliburn's respect and giving Sonic's shippers more fuel, Sonic faces King Arthur not as the weak knave he was at the beginning, but as the Knight of the Wind. Victory is claimed, and that's it?! Hatching Pokemon eggs takes longer than that! Well, upon returning to the main adventure mode, more story levels open up. Though, since they play the credits at that point, it's easy to see how one can miss that. You see, Sonic takes the scabbard to Merlina, who then reveals that the King Arthur he fought was an illusion and a trap to visit by her grandfather. Because... Okay, they don't explain that one. Covering up what happened with Mordred, I guess? She then takes over Camelot with the power of the scabbard. Huh, never knew how much power was contained in the friggin' weapon storage. Sonic and the Knights flee to create a barrier with the Knights' of swords in an attempt to dispel Merlina's sudden power surge. I almost went with power, period, but I felt that was too mean-spirited. They make the barrier, but it's too weak, so Sonic has to face Merlina himself. It's then that we find out why Merlina did what she did. To make Camelot eternal, because she fears the inevitable, chaotic end that her time will come to. I don't think there's a villain in the series, at least the games, that has been this well-intentioned. In many ways, this is a very logical thought process, born from common, everyday fear of the end. And she has the power to prevent the suffering of losing everything she and the others of this world know and love. For Sonic to oppose that is to guarantee the expiration date of this whole world and its people. What sane person would want to do that? Sonic even admitted that he can't be the hero every time. However, absolute power corrupts absolutely, an unchanging world will be very boring, and that's not how reality works. So Sonic willingly stands in Merlina's way, even if it means he and Caliburn are beaten up and broken. 
This iron will and the power of the sacred swords unleashes Calibur's true form, Excalibur, and grants Sonic another super form, Excalibur Sonic. Exactly the kind of overblown yet awesome design I like. After disposing of Melina's Final Fantasy boss monster and one of the more satisfying curb stomp final bosses I faced, Sonic calms her down by telling her that, even if the world has to end at some point, it's best to live life to the fullest in the time they have. At least, that's what I figure. A strong message from a strong story that supports it. Oh, and Sonic is revealed to be the true King Arthur. If you think that's a footnote in my review, don't. It's a footnote in the game, too. You are the, the one, one and true King Arthur? So Sonic was really a woman! I knew it! The game looks gorgeous. From the little details to the grand spectacles, this is quite the visual treat. The music is fantastic, with some great vocal and instrumental pieces playing throughout the levels and bosses. Even some great musical callbacks to the previous games during cutscenes. Special shoutouts go to Fight the Night for its Terminator-esque build-up, Grey Megalith for its grandiose atmosphere, and the ending song Live Life for its somber, yet uplifting tone. The cutscene presentation is nice, taking from Secret Rings' stylistic cutscenes and improving it, making a more visually entertaining story. Hell, even the voice actors weren't half bad this time around. It actually felt like everyone was trying their best, and hell, Griffith manages to get Sonic's character right on the nose in this game, making the writing that much more enjoyable. It's interesting to note that this was the last game with the four kids' voice cast before switching out everyone's voices save Dr. Eggman's, who is surprisingly absent from this game, probably the only time he ever was. Now for the gameplay, the hardest part to put into words. Let's start at the controls. You play with the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, already a major improvement from its predecessor since moving with the control stick is much more natural than tilting the Wii Remote left and right with Sonic on autopilot. A jumps, B unleashes Soul Surge, Z blocks, and you swing the sword by swinging the Wii Remote. There's some degree of technique depending on how you swing it, but which motion does what isn't exactly clear, and it doesn't even matter in the long run since the game never asks you to do a specific sword swing. This mechanic is responsive and satisfying to work with, a must, since that's the idea of the entire game. Unfortunately, extended play has a chance of causing wrist pains, though it's manageable since it only lasts a few days at most, and it's not advised to play games for so long anyways. The levels themselves are on rails like Secret Rings, with little to no branching paths. Though unlike Secret Rings, Sonic won't move without directional input, so he doesn't feel like controlling a speeding car the whole time. This makes the levels entertaining, but not unfair. One additional feature I like is the option to play as other characters, something the franchise became deathly afraid of at this point in time thanks to 06's failure. While you can only play as them in certain levels, it's still fun to utilize Lancelot's chaos powers, Gawain's gliding, and Percival's double jump. Sonic is the most reliable of the four, but I'm glad the option to spice up the gameplay is there. As Clement stated in his Let's Play of the game, the bosses feel like a punch-out fight, reading patterns and looking for an opening to strike, making the bosses a little more methodical than the usual Sonic fare. So they're great fun to take down, especially the Knights of the Round Table fights. As far as content goes, the main story only lasts a few hours, even counting the extra part of the story, and there's a few interesting challenge missions as well as some legacy missions that revert the gameplay to the classic Sonic format. Cute little secret that probably 20 people ever got to play. Other than that, there's the gallery that features unlockable bios, concept art, and even hint videos. This is where you'll find some neat fan artwork set to a beautiful violin rendition of It Doesn't Matter. Other than a throwaway multiplayer mode that boils down to hit each other, that's really it. Not exactly worth the $50 price tag it was going for back when it came out, but at least it's really cheap nowadays, so the value isn't as drastically off-putting. And that was Sonic and the Black Knight. And can you see why I enjoy this game so much? From the unexpectedly solid story to the entertaining gameplay, great soundtrack, and beautiful visuals, Sonic and the Black Knight ranks up there with my favorite Sonic games. My favorite is always Sonic 3 and Knuckles, but I can't really recall any moment where I was frustrated or unsatisfied with my experience. I'll take this over Secret Rings any day of the week. It's actually a shame that this game got the reception it did, because there's a lot of heart in this game. I would have liked to see what Sonic's other storybook adventures were like if they were made like Black Knight was, especially since after this game the series went a more comedic route, which would actually allow them to take advantage of silly concepts like this. If I were to rank this game, I'd give it a solid A rank. That was tight! I'm Transformers Fan Code 328, and I made it through the entire review without once making a Monty Python joke. And no, this doesn't count.
Huh. I think we may have just killed a man. If anyone asks, Jaden did it. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what? 